I'm Jason Casey, uh, the CTO at Beyond Identity, and this is uh, uh, another part in our series kind of explaining how do we overcome the issues uh, that we talked about uh, before in authentication, and we got pretty, pretty tactical talking about um, password issues, talking about uh, multi-factor issues that were based on uh, possession, weak possession, strong possession, et cetera. Uh, and now what we're going to do is we're going to actually kind of tear down the authentication architecture and rebuild it from scratch. And we're going to rebuild it in a step-by-step -step fashion. And we're going to focus on how do we eliminate each of these problems and think about the categories of the problems in more of a zero trust mindset. So just to remind ourselves, how do we understand relative to the operation of the transaction, right? So remember, in a zero trust world, we're not worried. We don't, we don't look at the world as an outside-in model. We look at it as an inside-out model, right? The world is composed of transactions. Transactions are from assets to resources or from resources to resources. Um, networks cannot be trusted. Assets cannot be trusted because where they are in the network, you kind of have to bootstrap trust. And so how do we actually go about doing that? So first, we'll start with authentication. And specifically, we'll talk uh, about uh, the password proliferation problem yesterday. So just to remind us a little bit, um, yesterday we, I keep saying yesterday, but uh, maybe it was tomorrow for you. And the password problem that we were talking about, we had Alice and we had the bank, right? And, uh, you know, Alice wanted to visit the site and there was a prompt to log in. She supplied her credentials, username and password, the site verified those username and password and assuming the answer was a yes, then presented um, a logged in session, right? An authorized uh, session, right? And when we blew this up yesterday, we basically said, well, the, the password, the username and password is a piece of data, right? And we look at data, we have to measure data um, uh, really in two ways from a security perspective, in motion and at rest. Uh, in terms of understanding like what is the surface area of that password, right? How do I actually worry about protecting it? We talked about things like, uh, well, uh, really the surface area in motion is about all of the individual connections. So in this example right here, we're just showing the connection from, you know, Alice uh, to the bank. But in the real world, uh, there's intermediate proxy servers in here, right? Uh, the bank is not really one uh, service. The bank is usually things like load balancers that front end web servers that may go off and talk to uh, message buses that may have um, uh, additional services they're talking to that may go off and talk to caches where those transparent caches then front end databases and those databases kind of dump into file systems, right? So. In the real world, we each of these connections is an in-motion thing that we have to worry about. And each of these devices is an at-rest uh, location that we have to worry about securing the password. Uh, of course, unless the password is salted, but if yesterday we showed that salting really is uh, a step that happens, uh, oh, it's a step that happens right here. So I don't really get salt protections uh, in this part of the world, but that's fine. The, this whole purpose really is just to show the surface area of a password is actually quite large from a security perspective. Usability of a password is not great. Um, otherwise, you, you would actually use a, uh, a unique string uh, for each service uh, that you access, and we all know that you probably don't. Um, and then, of course, password managers are kind of duct tape on the problem um, and still don't necessarily present a usable solution. So how could we address some of these things? Well, it turns out there's actually an easy answer around asymmetric uh, encryption. So just a, a quick reminder, um, when we're talking about encryption, uh, there's two types of encryption, right? There is symmetric and asymmetric, right? In symmetric, I have a key. As long as that key is shared by two parties, uh, they can converse or pass messages back and forth securely by using that key to encrypt the message. And then they send it over here, and then they can decrypt with that same key. Now, 
there's a key distribution problem. I have to distribute that key, um, which is not dissimilar from this password problem. An asymmetric encryption. The idea here is you actually have two keys. You have an encryption key and you have a decryption key. And as the name implies, they're asymmetric. They go in one direction. So in that world, if I have a, a clear text uh, message, I can encrypt it with my encryption key and send it. And it can only be decrypted by the decryption key, right? And the cool thing there is now, I act, because I have two keys, from a dis distribution perspective, I only have to really worry about distributing the decryption key. So that starts to actually um, free some things up. So from an authentication perspective, I can actually use this. Um, specifically, I can use it in what's called a signature. And I can use it in a signature um, to, um, to actually prove that I possess a thing, which is really fundamentally what, what passwords are about. So at a high level, and then we'll come back and, and, and drag into it at a low level. Let's go back to our Alice and the bank example. Alice wants to access the bank. So what the bank is going to do is the bank is going to say, the bank is going to issue what's called a challenge. And in that challenge, we'll simplify it and we'll just say, you know what, it's just a, it's just a random string. Random. And then what Alice is going to do is she's going to sign the challenge with her private key. So it comes back over here is essentially random, that random number from here, and a signature. And it's the signature over random. And so what the bank can do is the bank has Alice's public key. And the bank can use that public key to verify the signature, that the signature here is in fact correct against the public key. And what this actually shows us is only uh, the holder of the private key is able to produce the signature. So again, just a reminder of what that might look like from an envelope perspective, right? So imagine I have this envelope and I have that random string, right? Maybe I may have some other stuff in there too, right? What does a signature actually look like? Well, the first thing I do is I don't wanna, um, add, I don't wanna produce an encrypted version of this entire payload right? Because that's a lot, so I'm going to shrink it down. So how do I shrink it down? Uh, well, I'm going to shrink it down with a hash function. Remember, a hash function is a one-way function. Um, so when I hash this, I produce what's called, um, you think of it as a checksum, right? It is a fixed length value that is a unique, um, that is a unique point of this hash function over all of this input. Now, I'm just going to produce an encrypted version of that checksum using my private key, right? And so that's going to go here and we call that the signature. And that has the effect of what we call sealing the payload. And what we really mean by sealing the payload is if any, the way we verify the signature, I read the payload and I can clearly, I know the hash function, it's not secret, so I can calculate is the checksum valid, right? If anything has been changed, that, that calculation will be wrong, so it won't be valid, right? And then I have the public key, so I can actually decrypt the signature. And when I decrypt the signature, I'm just asking the question, are these two values equivalent? So what that actually lets me do now is complete this and verify that in fact, Alice does hold the private key. So I could use asymmetric cryptography, specifically digital signatures, using asymmetric cryptography to let Alice essentially prove the, the, a portion of the authentication step. She has a private key. And that private key never has to leave the device that Alice is on. So remember our, our data at motion, data at rest? With, my, um, with a asymmetric crypto, I can take all of the in motion problems, right? And I can basically just get rid of them because my private key never moves. 
Now, technically, there's a few things we need to worry about there, but we'll, uh, in terms of, well, how do I know Alice didn't copy it out or someone's on the machine and copies that off? But let's, let's take it one problem at a time. So private key never moves, right? Doesn't have to for this to work. And the public key does move, but the public key is not a vulnerability. It doesn't give anyone any ability to do anything other than verify signatures, right? So I've eliminated it in motion, and from an at-rest perspective, I've drastically shrunk the surface area. Because if the private key never leaves Alice's device, I'm no longer worried about anything being at rest through this entire chain except when I get back to Alice. And so that's what we're gonna set up next. So really, what we're, what we're the point we're trying to make here is when you move from um, shared secrets or, 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 or symmetric secrets to an asymmetric uh, form of cryptography, you can actually then use digital signatures as a form of authentication that completely eliminates a huge amount of the vulnerability that exists in passwords and shrinks um, uh, the at rest problem, right? The credential at rest problem to really one device. And next we're gonna talk about uh, how we actually uh, chip away at that problem.